Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well. In this next video podcast, my guest is none other than former double world time trial champion and Yumbo Bisma rider Rowan Dennis, who's recently announced his retirement from the sport at the end of 2023. So we look back on his career, some of the high points, some of the low points. We also look at the ever changing face of modern day cycling. And towards the end, we get serious about Lego. I hope you enjoy it. And here I am with none other than uh, Mr. Rowan Dennis. Rowan, thanks for joining me on, on, on the podcast, mate. I really appreciate it. We we speak a fair bit now, now and again. And the last time we did a pod was maybe two years ago, I think, when we had a when we had a chat about Lego. Do you remember? Yep, and we had the chips. Was it the chips? It? Yeah, the guess chip? that snack. Yeah, <laughs> guess that snack. And yeah. and obviously a lot has happened, which we'll we'll talk talk about in a minute but first and foremost mate where in the world are you because you do float around a lot where are you right now in my bedroom in your bedroom in what house <laughs> andorra <laughs> and andorra okay yeah, andorra, so yeah. you, you flip between obviously australia is girona you've still got a place in girona as well yeah just when it's not really good weather to train in andorra if it's snowy or it's going to be just general pretty average winter weather sure Drone is always pretty pretty stable, to be honest with you. So keep that place uh, just basically as a on hold. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. So, Rowan, you recently announced, I think it was only about four or five days ago, your retirement. You're 32 now, aren't you? I think I'm right. I've not yeah, even got pro- Yeah, th- th- mate, <laughs> 53 for crying out loud. You're a young man. You've got it all in front of you. But you've, you've had an amazing career so far, mate. But... At what point did you come to the decision? Because it's a big decision and you, you're ending on a high. I mean, it's still early in the season. You've had a big win already this year, but you've made that call now. At what point did you come to that decision, mate? Uh, when I signed this contract, I I, I thought, okay, um, it's getting it's getting on. I'm not I'm not getting any younger. These young guys are coming up. They're they're pushing our our limits pretty pretty hard every day yeah um the game is changing uh i'll, I'll do this contract 100 obviously uh and potentially go for another one after that but then pff, that's it i would never go any longer than another contract after um and it was just honestly mid to late last year it was just getting a little bit monotonous uh and just I feel like I was missing a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, I'm not. I'm not obviously present. I'm never going to be present 24 seven at home. But because obviously there's always going to be a job, whether I'm working normal or or what, uh, what not as a normal person, if we're being honest. Yeah. But uh, more time at home would be great. Uh, so it actually, it's been weighing on me for months and i've been sort of tiptoeing around the whole letting it out and and it was starting to bug me it was really starting to piss me off um, okay. and get to me a bit because people were like oh yeah uh obviously you're going to talk another contract or or how long you're going to ride for and i just had to keep lying and i just hated it sure but stuff it i was out on the bike and mel and i just decided today just put it out there and it's been a huge weight off the shoulders yeah it's um it's actually now i'm i'm actually enjoying writing more which is weird yeah uh i tried to always think i because i knew i was going to retire um this as in before the start of the season and i thought okay everything's a last so I try and enjoy it, but I just still couldn't because I was still lying essentially to everybody. Yeah. So I thought, nah, I just get to get this off my chest. Um, and I did. And obviously a couple of days to sort of decompress from that and whatnot. But now I'm actually pretty motivated. Um, yeah. More motivated than what I was. Obviously, I won a stage down under, so it yeah. started well. Uh, but I uh, really want to go out on a high really want to go out high and 
um, not be just pack fill. There's nothing, sure. nothing worse than just being pack fill. Uh, it's, it's pretty crappy just being in the bunch and cruising around and getting your ass handed to you. <laughs> to I, yeah. I mean, I mean, you, it's a really interesting point you, you mentioned a minute ago. And, and um, the reason I spoke, I, I mentioned right at the start was when we last properly spoke on it like this so on a podcast was the scene was like 2020 when we had COVID and then, and then obviously things were evolving anyway, in terms of just the, these young riders coming through, but the last couple of years, just as somebody who observes the sport, I'm still a mass, I'm a massive fan, but I work in the sport and see it, commentate on it. It's becoming quicker, more unpredictable. These young riders coming in. I mean, for you over the last couple of years, can you just describe what it's like? Because you're, you're a very, you're right at the top of the tree, you know, double world champion. You've won stage and all the grand tours. You've done a lot and you're still only a relatively young man, but there's this new generation, this new way of racing. How's it been like to be one of the kind of elder statesmen, but seeing these new riders coming through, how have you been able to cope with it? Can you just describe what it's been like? Uh, you said it pretty well. That it's it's becoming more unpredictable. And you think, God, oh, like initially it started because of Remco, which annoyed me. <laughs> because you'd be like, why are you attacking with 60k to go? And you're like, stop being annoying. But then he kept winning solo. Yeah. And you're like, I not <laughs> say a word, but like, you, you little, <laughs> you little rascal, you little rascal, you little rascal. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then young, more young guys came through and they're like, well, I'll do it as well. I'll do it as well. And it's actually, it it took me back to my amateur and junior days where you, if you don't join them, you're sort of just hoping that someone else will bring it back. And then eventually someone doesn't and they just go away or a small group goes away. And it's more it's more thinking on your toes than obviously in Grand Tours a little bit different. It's more yeah. predict, predictable, but these one-week races or, or anything shorter than the Grand Tour is really just all in and most of the time these these young guys just seem to just bounce just bounce and bounce if they and it's like their confidence is through the roof if they if they get their head kicked in one day they go, oh well, i'll do it again tomorrow yeah and i always when i got my head kicked in as a, an amateur or or neo i was like let's try not happen i don't want that to happen again just yeah. let's let's just be a little bit more sit back and see how it goes and, and try to build to become good enough to do that again. Um, but these guys are just, that is bounce. Yeah. And, oh, okay. Whatever. And it's like, they just don't care in that sense. They're like, Oh, I lost. I'll try again tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so so change a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's so many asset aspects of the sport um, that have changed. I mean, there's the safety issue, which is a big, a, a big talking point. I mean, that maybe that's for another, another sort of discussion, but do you think it's, these young riders coming through, clearly there's a lot more open source training information and we're getting more and more out of endurance athletes across the board. It, it, just sport is getting quicker, faster, higher, longer. Everything yeah. is, is is getting better. But alongside that, you know, you, you have these kids who clearly just like having fun and taking risks as well. So there's quite, an, there's quite a new element to the unpredictable side of it is the, is the willingness to actually lose, which is quite an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, and I find that the... The days when I actually am willing to lose or just, oh, I'll stuff it like until then under. I was saying to Robert Guessing when I was out on a ride today, I said, normally I wouldn't just go. I predicted that it would be a bunch sprint, small bunch sprint that day. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to, I have to go with these guys. They're dangerous for GC. And if I didn't go, it would have come back. They would have had one less guy rolling through. Yeah. And my prediction would have been right. And maybe I've been a victim of my own predictions. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's just the way it is or has been. Yeah. We're like, no, nah, it's going to be a bunch of sprint today. It's going to be, so you make sure it's going to be, so you're not wrong. Yeah, sure. Going, it could be a bunch of sprint. Let's try and make sure it's not. And that's basically what I did that day. Yeah. Is I'm like, do you know what? Stuff it. Have a crack. Yeah. What's the worst going to happen? Because because you come through an era of riders and an era of riding where numbers more than anything have become more important. Um, 
the understanding of how a race is shaped as as there's been we've tried to kind of understand cycling to a point where it's become almost sterile and and you you can as a commentator as a rider as a ds you can predict so much but we're moving away from that now and um but as an individual having come through teams where you've been put on the front you, you know you obviously you've you know how to control your abilities your power output there's there's so many things that you're trying to control and that gives you a certain mind that gives you a certain mindset doesn't it but to step out of that that must have been quite refreshing especially now you've got a seat your last season you're in great form you got that win where you just rolled the dice a little bit that must make you feel quite excited actually for this final big hurrah mate i mean uh and uh, are you, yeah it must be you must be looking forward to it yeah it, it well there's no no thing hanging over my head of if i don't perform this year uh, if I've taken risks and I don't get the results, I, what's going to happen with my contract? Yeah. Um, so that's somewhat dangerous. And for other people, if you're willing to really have a crack and and throw caution to the wind, um, and also could just end massively badly, like for me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I've got no no results since still down under. I tried to race and do something completely different and it's and it didn't work. And I go, oh well, I had a good good run for eleven years. Yeah. <laughs> so back to the whole thing though, the problem well, not the problem, the way cycling has always worked is that teams want to be able to make things predictable. Yeah. So they can control the somewhat uncontrollables, and then their leader is more in control because their little pawns helping them yep. are more or less doing all the, the heavy lifting. So they save energy and then they can use their energy when they really need to, not on a sprint day or a mid mountain day. It's the only the queen stage you go all in and then you maybe have a time trial where it's best man wins. Sure. It's all is all to try and make it predictable, but now these it's just Yeah. Stuff it. Yeah. It's, it's good. Have yeah. A crack. Yeah, it, it's. I must admit. I mean, I, I'm not physically experiencing it. And then the, the more riders I speak to about this very question, especially the riders that have been around a little bit longer in their late twenties, early thirties, are saying it's. Just, they're just like, like the tour last year. I was speaking to Philippe Gilbert, and it, I looked at him and said, "This is hard, isn't it?" He said, "He said, mm. Matt, this is just nuts." He said, "It's just full gas every day, and this is at every race. The Giro is the same, you know." Yeah. So, for mm. you then that. For the rest of the year, I don't know what what does your program look like in terms of Grand Tours. Are you in with a shout of riding the Tour, or is that yet to be determined? Or are you going to ride the Jura? What's the plan for you, Rowan? And you're you're involved in it in the in the team. At the moment, it's uh, I've got Grand Camino, Paris Nice, uh, Basque, which is definitely the best race for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh mate, I, I reckon I might be the heaviest guy there, or one of definitely. Um, and I'm not a big, big guy. Um, I feel sorry for anyone who's bigger than me at that race. Uh, unless they're beating me, then they can they can jog on. Um, uh, Romandy Swiss, uh, Worlds is a big goal. Yeah, big goal. Um, and then potentially the Vuelta, potentially. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I've got a fair few opportunities with uh, uh, Romandy and Swiss. Um and obviously, Worlds is all in for the TT. Um, yeah. Help out. If I'm in the road race, help out. It is what it is. Um, uh, Basque, uh, Paris Nice, and Grand Camino is more or less all in for um, Jonas. So, okay. team time trial in Paris Nice is a pretty big goal, personal goal, obviously, for me. Uh, there's no individual there. Basque. I dare say the TT there is going to be something with 20 plus percent in it. Probably. Most likely. Not most going likely. to be great for me. Um, so, yeah, it's it's more or less small little goals along the way. And then Romandy all in, all yeah. in for Romandy. Swiss, see how the form is really. It's yeah. always one of those pre tour races where it's, you can land on your feet with your form or, think you are and get your absolute ass handed to you <laughs> yeah that, 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 that happened to me when i rode romandy actually it's uh yeah i got i got my head kicked in a long 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 time ago <laughs> but i'm i'm going to be commentating on it so i'll be watching closely um rowan oh you've disappeared i've disappeared oh, oh, I'm back. you're back you're back mate you're back 
Let's just, uh, you're frozen. There we go. You're back, mate. You're back. I'm back. I'm all good. Yeah. So, yeah, Rock to- I'm going to be commentating on Romandy with Nico Roach, actually, mate. So we're watching your, your progress, your, your progress in that one. And then, so the Worlds, of course, um, Glasgow. Do you know much about the course? Have you had a chance to scope it out? Are you going to no. uh, think much about it at all? I haven't seen anything. I think it's about 40, 44K or something, more okay. or less. Um, I don't think there's a Villa View thing out yet. Uh, but just knowing anything in the UK, it's probably going to be somewhat lumpy. It's going to be heavy as well, heavy road as well. Should I call it the UK? Probably not. Uh, you, you, UK is fine because it is part. It's, yeah, just you can call it UK. You can call it Britain. Just don't call it England. <laughs> just don't call it England, mate. Uh, the Scottish are a very proud, a very proud people. But mate, up there, um, that neck of the woods, I don't know it particularly well, but I've done some riding up there before and some racing. Uh, Tour of Britain back in the Tour of Britain days, and there'll be really heavy roads, probably quite similar to when you won in Yorkshire. So I, well, I don't. Think, yeah. Com Games, Glasgow, twenty four. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, second to none other than bloody Alex Dowson. Of course, yeah. Alex. <laughs> he will never let me live that down. Of course, as well. of course he won't. He'd be dining out on that, mate, for, 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 for a long, long time. No, it's good that you've got, I mean, that sort of focus. And you are, when you look at when you when you won the Worlds, when you, you're basically, basically riding on your own in, in, in Yorkshire, that was really, you are somebody quite unique in that aspect. You, you know, and, and when you said you're going to go for the Worlds, you clearly your facial expression changed slightly. You clearly are, you have the ability to focus on one particular goal. You know you can win it. I mean, that would be going out on your career on a massive high, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, Yorkshire was, that was a difficult one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was one I didn't, I didn't expect that form. Okay. From no racing at all. Um but also it showed that I had no racing when it came to that road race. I think I got three hours in and I was absolutely ruined. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people were there, mate, on that day. I, I'm, I'm not joking. I was, yep. Yeah, I got into the bus and I was shivering. Uh, I had no energy, nothing. Uh, but yeah, everything similar to um, Birmingham, you could say, Uh didn't race really. You, I wouldn't call Swiss last year me racing. I was just a passenger. Okay, <laughs> to be honest, for four days, um, just and I hadn't raced uh, since Romandy really raced properly. So it was just basically try and try and focus, try and focus for. In the end, was it forty days? We mapped it out from when I really started to train again. Yeah. Um, after having COVID, it was 40 days. Okay, let's go. Um, let's try to replicate what I did before Yorkshire and just, okay, we're a little bit behind. Yeah. Let's just try and catch up a little bit here and yep. there. Uh, worked uh, one more time, maybe. <laughs> That's, I do like the UK. It works well for me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's an all or nothing. Uh, again, uh, championship for me, just goal in, uh, throw caution to the wind with training, just go, oh, well, let's push it a little bit harder, push it a yeah. bit harder. Yeah. Um, what have I got to lose? Yeah. Uh, hopefully I, I don't, push it too hard and end up on in a ditch somewhere <laughs> somewhere at training and calling an ambulance but yeah it's it's the last time like i said it can can end really well or spectacularly bad um this year and it'll all be a learning curve for whatever i do in the future yeah and that's just just before we move on to what you might be doing in the future just tell us a little bit about the Yumbo Visma team. Um, every team, as we know, is different, um, a different ideology, different culture. And you've been with several teams over your over your long over your long career, mate. What, what, what's it like being a part of the Yumbo Visma squad? Obviously, a ridiculously successful team. Um, what's it like being a part of the setup there? Structured, very structured. Uh, like I actually mentioned before, 
everything is trying to be make everything predictable. Sure. Um, which is great. Uh, I'd rather it that way, to be honest with you, than just being thrown a curveball every day. Yeah. Um, in general, uh, is also as you mentioned, ridiculously successful as a team, which puts pressure on the riders from above and below. Yeah, because your position is at stake. You don't know. Okay. Yeah. If you're not performing, you're out. Yeah. You're out of that race. Someone else is going to fill that spot 100%. Which some people might go, oh, that's, that's, not, that's not good. I think it's actually a good thing. Okay. There's a lot of times when in, back in the track days, it was, ah, screw you. I want to be the best. I want to be the best. So if you have that drive, it really works well for you. Yeah. Um, no, no, I'm going to make sure I'm in this team. So you, you always try to be a little bit more perfect sure. every day. Yeah. And that's really the sort of culture, which is great. I think yep. is actually good. Um, it's not easy to create that. It takes time. And it's taken what, since they were Blanco back in, what was it, 20, 2015? Yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. Elkin or Blanco back at 14, 15. Things were pretty rough. And they built, 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 built. And now it's just, poof. yeah. Everything's sort of rolling really well, snowball effect sort of thing. And and people want to be a part of the team. Good writers, not just, oh, I just need a contract. Good yeah. writers want to be a part of the team. They're finding writers that you wouldn't necessarily look at. Christopher uh, Laporte. Yeah. Shit. What a season, yeah. I mean, what a season he had last year. It was incredible, <clears throat> wasn't it? He's like a different rider. I mean, we he's always had that potential where they're just elevated into another level, haven't they? Yeah, like you'd look at him in Cofidis, yeah, yeah, he's good. But when it came to the team, you're like, holy shit. <sighs> holy shit. Yeah. You'd think he's the most underrated rider uh, before he started performing almost immediately. Um, and everyone's like, oh, who's this? Oh, that's right. He was good at Cofidis. Now he's exceptional in Yumbo. Right. Um, so, yeah, just that sort of culture and it, it just grows, grows and grows. How long that lasts for, who knows? There's always a team that sort of takes over for a certain period of time and then other teams find a way to catch up and, and challenge that. Ineos before that was what, shit, I'm trying to think who was before Ineos, who was winning everything. Well, we know US Postal was for a while. Yeah, but- I mean, uh, it was a it was a kind of new generation when <laughs> when 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 Sky Club they kind of wrote, rewrote the rules. But I don't think there were, there was a team. It was really Tonto. Yeah, there, there wasn't really yeah. a team. Yeah, it was Astana a little bit in the tours and stuff, I guess, with Contador. But there wasn't yeah. really a a team that dominated like like Sky did for the best part of a decade. No. Um, which you're obviously you're a part of part of latterly. But uh, it it is really in, in, interesting, and they are you know. Let's hope that. Um, well, clearly, you've started off in winning ways and getting a, it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Especially as commentators, we talk about getting a win early is important, but it is important, isn't it? To get that win and in the way you did it, mate. And I, I watched it and um, you were obviously flying that day, but you were st- it, what I liked about it, you were really smart the way you you, you took the, some extra pace into that corner and opened it up a little bit early. It was just, you must be super satisfied when you look, look back and reflect on the way you took that win physically and also just how uh, how intelligent you were. Yeah, there was two options coming out of that corner, basically. I either had a gap or I didn't. Uh, if I had the gap, what I did was what was in my head. If I didn't, I knew that Jai wasn't necessarily a threat after having to go through those sort of corners and then trying to drive. So I could somewhat control the effort from there and let the guys behind me try and out sprint me, which I was pretty confident wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I just had to not go with 300 meters to go. Sure. Um, and if they jumped me early, then it was their bad luck. Um, and then I just used, then I just used Jai as a sort of a running onto launch pad. Yeah. Um, that was the worst case scenario. I didn't want that to happen. To be honest, with you. I was, I didn't know what Schmidt could do. Yeah. Um, so my best bet was to make sure he wasn't 
there. To yeah. be so I thought, okay, all in. Came out the corner. Thank God he's not on my wheel. No one, there's a bit of a gap and just, let's just go. Just go. Worked well. Probably one of my better 30 second efforts. Yeah. <laughs> Can you can you share can you share what numbers you were doing for 30, uh, half a minute there, mate? Because it's it's fascinating stuff. You know, I, I really find it fascinating. I noticed thirty seconds was, I think from it was nine hundred and four. Right. Okay. Uh, what date was that? Thirteenth. No. Here we go. Let's have a look. Let's have a so, deep dive. Yep. Yeah, found it. It's all good. Good stuff. So, thirty seconds. Nine hundred and six. Wow. Uh, peak power wasn't huge. It was more, it was, uh, it was 1250. Right. Um, so yeah, it was 1250 and then I just sort of held it more or less. Yeah. Uh, so it was 12 seconds was still 11, 1140. Wow. That's um, so just a kick, hold, hold, hold. And then yeah. that's when I sat down and, just ruled it. Was, it. Okay, just all in, put the head down and saw me bobbing away. And that's great, man. No, it was great. I was uh, I was cheering you one, mate. It was uh no, a, a great, a great great win. It's really set the tone nicely for this for this for this final year, mate. And did what when you look back on your career, you've still got another year, you know, and hopefully it will bring a lot more success, mate. But what do you think is um your biggest achievement so far in your career? Or what do you look back on with the, the most fondness, either with a team perspective or individually? What's given you the most personal satisfaction? Uh, I mean, there must, I guess there's a several, there must be several, uh, uh, more than several, given the, the teams you've been with and the wins you've had. I, there's two that stand out. Yeah. Um, there's one other than those two that was a, wasn't a win, but was an achievement that or it, it made me feel like a huge win. Yeah. And it made me feel really proud of what I'd done. Um, so I worked back. So that one was Tokyo. Um, I'm not going to delve into why it made me proud, but okay. it, and because it's just going to be a long story drawn out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you asked me a year or two before, I would have said, there's no way I'm going to be happy with anything but first. Okay. You can you can jog on, gold medal war. <laughs> I don't want yeah. to be there. Um, so that was, that really sort of sits with me. And it's like, well, it made me think winning isn't everything. It's obviously the process and what everything, how everything went to get to that point. The... Number two for me, which was almost sort of that launch pad for me with confidence, knowing that I could continue to win and not just be a second or third, fourth, fifth place time trialer was that Tour de France prologue. Yeah. So that was my first ever pro win as a in a time trial. Um I'd had 10 second places, I believe five third places. Wow. Okay. Um, those 10 second places were to, from memory, seven different people. Right. Okay. <laughs> Blow me. Which just shit me to tears um, because one week I'd, I'd get beaten by somebody and then the next week I'd absolutely destroy them and someone else would beat me. Yeah. I'm like, when is this going to end? You can, oh, it was it was in two and a half years that many second places it really started to shit me off so eventually that and if you from that point onwards i didn't really lose a time trial other than if it was uh olympics worlds um until 2018 or end of 2018 yeah so 2019 was the first time i lost again uh, really? So I okay, I lost an uphill time trial in Romandy. I lost the prologue in Romandy in 2018. Um, but other than that, I didn't lose anything other than Worlds and Olympics. Right. Um, for that next two and a half years. Uh, top one, probably going to pick it. 
Yorkshire. Yeah. Magnificent. Uh, just because it wasn't just me. It wasn't it wasn't not because it was a screw you to anybody. It was just a straight up one of those days, nothing, nothing went wrong. Everything was going right. Um, mentally, physically. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I even forgot to have my, my routine coffee. Um, I was just, whatever happens, happens today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was on the ergo warming up and I've realized when I saw someone else had a coffee, I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, Brad, I need that, 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 crack, a that, crack, that would have cracked me big time. Want to give me a coffee? Quick, I need a coffee. And I'm like, it's too hot. Put some, put some cold water in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smashing the coffee on the ergo. Um, but yeah, before that, obviously there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, and yeah, uh, that was also a big test mentally. Um, not just for me, there's a, a huge strain on not just for me as well. Um, and we all pulled through, uh, and then it sort of, yeah, it pride sort of set me up for what the next four years. Yeah, obviously, I was out of the sport technically before that Worlds, yeah. uh, out of a contract 10 days before actually terminated. Uh, which was stressful. Uh, but it was, yeah. I took on uh, two new mortgages. Wow. Oh, God. What was it? About three weeks before that. And it wasn't, oh, okay, I'm just going to go buy two houses. Uh, that was done in June. Obviously, there's a settlement period. <laughs> oh, so uh, not just the whole what's going on it's like well are we going to be able to afford everything yeah sure um and i know that seems a bit first world problem you've got two two houses but it's a big commitment isn't it and then suddenly where, where where's my income you know it's a bit you've got a family to look after you know oh shit <clears throat> you just sell them just sell them oh shit what am i going to do yeah so that there was a lot riding on that welds a yeah. lot um, and I actually was not thinking about any of that on the day. Just Which about clarity, I, yeah. I was just like, and I, I it seems a bit soppy, uh, but uh, Mel, Mel came that morning to my hotel. It was a bit of a stress actually getting to the hotel as it is at any worlds with all the crap that you have to do to get into across roads and all that sort of stuff. And um, she took a photo of, myself and Oliver on the bed, just playing around. And she sent it to me when I was, I think we were driving to the, the TT. Uh, and I posted it on social media. And from memory, it was what really matters or yeah. what actually matters, something along those lines. It was just a short what actually matters or something. Um, and it was genuinely what I was thinking. I'm like, Phew. I'm literally here on a bike today. Phew. Whatever happens today happens. It yeah. is, it's just a bike race. And I actually made, there was not a single thought about materialistic stuff at all. At all. I didn't actually care. Yeah. It made me realize what was mad, what mattered to me. And it actually probably was a huge reason why I, I performed so well that day. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's that's, I mean, Thank, thank you for taking so much time to and thought to to take us through because clearly it was a magnificent victory and, and I spoke to you after and afterwards I know Melissa was there and well to have your family near and sometimes you need these these little moments to remind you of what is important in life and why we do things um because our lives are busy there's a lot of pressure but, but what what why do we put ourselves through this and and I know you all. Like, I know you just. I mean, we're saying that you just come off social media for for, for a while. You're, you're off Instagram, but the, your last couple of posts, I think, were really poignant, mate. Because you, you called time on a career, um, or they still got a, an, another year left. But you do. You've got to focus at what makes you happy, and what makes you tick as a person. You're still a young man. You're only 32. You've got a young family, a wife that you love. You know, um, 
and you've got the rest of your life ahead of you and you have to call time on it at some point so you can do the things you've earned the right to be able to not have that pressure and, and enjoy your family and, and to spend time with them so that's important that's what this is all about isn't it yeah just and i've jumped off there's no no ill will behind it <clears throat> it was just i spent way too much time on this crap i think we all do i think we all do mate yeah yeah I, I click on it for no reason at all and I flick through it for the next 20 minutes and I go, okay, there's some funny memes. <laughs> Gives you a good laugh. Uh, you, you flick through the stuff that other people send you. You go, oh, that was rough, but I'll laugh, whatever. <laughs> but in the end, I'm like, I actually, I thought the other day, I'm like, what should I do? Because obviously I've deactivated, not deleted, just deactivated. Um because sometimes I'll just be, I'll just sit on the couch and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> should I read a book? Uh, what should I do? Because I don't know. I genuinely don't know what I should do. It's one of those things where I've been reliant on this crap. Yeah. For the best part of a decade or more. It's just grown with us. And I'm like, what the hell, what should I do? I don't have gardening to do. Um, have you not, have you not got any more Lego to do? Uh, just check this out, check this, mate. I know you're a big fan of art and you're a big fan of Lego. I'm going to show you this. Hold on. Holly got it for me for Christmas. You're going yep. to like this one, mate. I will. It's, uh, it's Van Gogh Starry Night Lego. That is good. That is good. So you got a little Van Gogh there, and there's that. I've not done it yet. It's in a frame. You can hang it on the wall. So Starry Night Van Gogh from from MoMA, mate. Perfect. And this isn't an ad, by the way. Uh, just, <laughs> just we just both like Lego, and I thought you'd appreciate that. So I'm going to find a bit of time to do that, mate. So <laughs> you're going to you're going to laugh at this. I uh, last Christmas, so twenty well twenty twenty one, uh, Mel bought me the Titanic. Right, right. And I said, okay, and we got it sent to Australia because I'm like, I'm not going to build was ten thousand pieces or something, and then eventually have to rebuild it i'm not i'm not doing that i'm just not nah. it's one time and that's it i'm not rebuilding it uh so everything i've got in the last couple of years i've just kept in the box yeah and this year i'm like oh, we're in dubai we're at legoland ah oh, that titanic i really want it and i was like I'm pretty sure I got that for you for Christmas last year. It's going to be quite a big present as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I just, I left it with my parents. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Yep. Cheers. Just leave it there. Right. I'll do it one day when we move back to Australia. One day, whatever it is. And uh, I'm like, oh, I just completely forgot about it. I went to buy it again. She goes, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Let's check it first. And actually, I don't know what we bought instead. Um, there's something else and that's another problem I've got that many Lego <laughs> things that you don't know yeah I don't actually know what I've got I've got I, I know I've got the Mel Millennium Falcon yeah uh, I've got the the uh, I think the Death Star yep still in the box Um, oh, I've got there was another there was another Egyptian one or something uh titanic and then there was i think it was another it was the world okay the, map of the world right on the wall which is another ten thousand pieces or something wow okay that's what i got and it's basically a painting where you can frame it and put it on the wall and it's huge that's what i got so they're just in boxes sitting around the world in places in that, various places that i don't know exactly where they are but they're somewhere um so yeah i've got oh, a good thirty thousand pieces to build at, at your some... retirement <clears throat> so it sounds like you're the first couple of years of your ret uh, retirement might, might be uh building a new lego world you have to sort of get a lego room and and and, and have oliver in there helping you out that'd be amazing a whole le room of just lego but don't forget i've got all the ones already had which i have to break and then rebuild. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's so quite, that's quite stressful. 
That's another, what, 30,000 pieces. So there's about 60,000 pieces of Lego I have to break and rebuild. Last time I did this, I had a huge hip flexor problem. Um, <laughs> bent over doing it. There's some days we'd be sitting seven, eight hours doing it on the coffee table. Like, shit, I haven't had dinner. <laughs> It's that you do get in the zone, though, don't you? It, 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 I, I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant habit. I, I, I know uh, um, Mark Cavendish is a good mate as well. He loves Lego. He's addicted. So I, I think there's two people in the world I send pics of Lego. Well, three: my wife, you, and Cav. Anytime I go to like a big Lego shop and I see something cool, I'm pinging you photos. It's, I, I love it. But uh, yeah, it's just brilliant, mate. Brilliant. Like big, big and shit when I'm yeah. in Lego land, right? I'm oh, a- seriously. It was 40 degrees, humid or some crap. It was it was disgusting. I, I was sweating. I was swaying. I was I dizzy all day. Like, but I love it. I'm in Legoland. I'm in Legoland. <laughs> oh, that's great, mate. That's great. Well, Rome, with I, I said it was we we're gonna have a half an hour chat. It's 45 minutes now, mate. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure. It always is. You, you know, you're such a generous talker, mate. And it's great to see you smiling. Great to see with that win already on the board for this year. And um our paths will cross later in the year, but it just remains for me to wish you a fantastic season. And everybody here at We Love Cycling, you know, um, does the same. To have a cracking season with you and your Jumbo Bisman teammates. And uh, and thanks for your time, bud. It's been great. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Nice one, mate. Thank Cheers. You.